Okay. I am Troy Tittlemeyer, the CEO of Magma Kim Research Institute. Uh, I left the oil and gas industry at the end of 2019 with the opportunity to work with Stan Keith and work with Magma Kim. And it was uh, an incredible journey since day one, as some of you can imagine, working with Stan every day and getting to understand the depth of Magma Kim and the history of Magma Kim. And um, I'm very honored to be here today. And I want to say on behalf of Magma Kim, thank you to the Arizona Geological Society for allowing us the opportunity to speak to all the members, the people of the society. It's so important to keep us together as geoscientists and uh, these platforms exist. Got an interruption there. Good. They couldn't exist with I'm getting feedback. Sorry. I'm not. All right. It couldn't exist without everybody here, even the one that can't figure out how to mute their microphone. Uh, it allows us to to collaborate. It allows us to ask questions and it allows us to the opportunity to really share these ideas. And tonight specifically is sharing the ideas that came about three years of research from Dr. Jan Rasmussen and Stan Keith as they were asked to contribute to what we believe will be a major contribution, not to just Arizona geology, but to geology as a whole. Uh, the work for this fourth edition of the Mineralogy of Arizona is absolutely incredible. The details are incredible. So we're going to get through this. Jan Rasmussen, her point for this presentation was that she wants to know, wants everyone to know that the magma metal series classification, the colors that you're going to see of these polygons and the map across the whole state of Arizona, these colors are empirically built and they're, they're backed by a lot of research and it's incredible the the amount of details that go into that she's going to talk about that and teach us so that's the important part with that she's a, a an amazing researcher and she's a teacher and she's going to teach us about the magma metal series and how we can use it as a viable tool as geoscientists to de-risk our exploration of to de-risk our time and attention on the project stan keith in this three-year journey, he, he saw all these economically potential mineral systems that not a lot of folks talk about. And he said, there's a lot of potential in the state of Arizona. Arizona is, for several reasons, is an exciting place for metal exploration in our future. And certainly in the next five to 10 years, you would argue we could be going into a bull market for the metals industry. That's huge. Arizona is favorable to metal exploration. Arizona should be looked at very seriously and very carefully the geology and the opportunities we have in this state to uh to take on the responsibility of have of controlling and, and allowing us to explore for the natural resources that our country is relying on so this is an exciting talk uh, again it's an honor to share this time with you and thank you again to the arizona geological society for this opportunity and uh, i think this talk is going to be uh very really fun we, we look forward to the discussions at the end Dr. Jen Rasmussen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you all see the uh, screen? Yep. Okay. I was asked about three or four years ago by Ray Grant to write about the geologic history of Arizona and prepare the mineral district maps so that mineral collectors could easily use the maps to find their uh, samples they like. So the former edition, the third edition of Mineralogy of Arizona was done in 1995 and Ray Grant was one of the authors. So he's the principal author of our fourth edition. So Ron Gibbs, Harvey Jong, myself and Stan Keith are the other co-authors. And the U of A Press will publish this in late 2021 or 2022. So we're still talking about the uh, cover, but that gives you an idea. So the previous map of mineral districts was done in 1983 at the Arizona Geological Survey. And it uh, had sort of a non-predictive um, kind of uh, schedule of, of mineral types. So it was not real specific on the kinds of um, deposits that you could find. So we wanted to use the magma 
metal series that Stan has developed over the last 30, 40 years to uh, uh, help people de-risk their exploration. So one of the things that we want to emphasize is that mining districts of the past are different from what we're calling mineral districts. So the mineral districts are based on the geology and the um, uh, type of metals, the source of magmas, the date of uh, the million years ago that the deposit was formed and so forth. So that um, that's different from the old mining districts. So here you see the uh, former one with the uh, sort of blobs. There are fairly good uh, dis location information, but it was really hard to use the uh, colors to help you find where particular minerals would be. So that was our goal. So this is going to be the new uh, mineral district map. And all the maps are done. John Callahan has uh, turned them into pretty, uh, added the roads and the uh, topography so that you can locate yourself. So we have um, improved the quality from the third edition, which was just blob maps, to the present one, which is very specific on the type of metals like porphyry coppers um, or the um, uh, types of um, uh, age dates and um, metals that would occur there. So in this presentation and in the book, we have subdivided them according to what are called the magma metal series. So we've got these uh, hot colors of reds and yellows are the metaluminous ones, and the cool colors of the blues are the paraluminous types. And the paraluminous types are basically two mica granites, both muscovite and biotite in the associated igneous rocks. So these paraluminous ones are crustal melt. The uh, metaluminous ones are sourced in the magma. So those colors are standard throughout this presentation. So in the uh, example here, the yellow refers to porphyry coppers. The um, blues here uh, represent uh, tungsten or copper gold systems. And what we've noticed as we put these maps together is that there are what we call super systems. In other words, a large area where you have the same kind of, of ore deposit, uh, same age, same metals, so forth. So the concept for mineral collectors and for mineral exploration people is anywhere in this super system might be a good place to find similar minerals or similar ore deposits. So sort of stay in elephant country when you're um, looking for elephants. So that basic classification of paraluminous and metaluminous subdivides the types according to this variation diagram. And all of these uh, definitions are described in more detail in all of the publications that Stan and I have done over the last, and Monty Swan have done over the last, um, say, 30, 40 years, one of which was in an Arizona Geologic Society publication. So if you're a member, you can easily go and download those. So the um, pair aluminous or two mica granite ones can be deciphered based on a variation diagram of the whole rock geochemistry with strontium on the y-axis and weight percent of calcium oxide on the x-axis. So you get your whole rock analysis of the rock, the igneous rock that's associated with it, 
and plot it on this uh, plot and find out whether it's alkali calcic, whether it is calcalcalic, in which case it would probably be a tungsten deposit or if it is paraluminous calcic, in which case it would be a gold deposit. So um, many times we do not have these um, detailed geochemical analyses. So what we use instead are the uh, minerals. So if you've got both biotite and muscovite, if there's a presence of garnet, tourmaline, pegmatites, aplites, so on, then you would be in this paraluminous uh, part of the diagram. So in terms of plate tectonics, you get these, um, de these paraluminous deposits when you have flat subduction or when you have continent-continent collision. In Arizona, we found uh, the all the paraluminous ones are associated with flat subduction. And there was one of these flat subduction episodes at the end of every one of the 14 or so orogenies that have affected Arizona. Now, if you're in the lower part of this diagram, that's metaluminous, and that would be where you have minerals such as uh, hornblende, any amphiboles, pyroxenes, olivines, so on. So in the case of the metaluminous, the way you find out which class it is, is with this diagram, which has K2O whole rock versus SiO2 in the whole rock. So for example, if you plot the K2O versus SiO2 and you end up in this yellow uh, area, then you have calcalcalic and you are likely to have a porphyry copper deposit. If you end up in this alkali calcic zone, the orange zone, then you may have copper in your analyses, but it will not be economic for copper. It might be economic for zinc, silver, or lead. So this diagram is how you determine which of these classes you would be in. And the way that those are caused is from where the melting occurs uh, in the subducting zone. So if the melting has occurred down here, this is the gold copper zone or the MQA, the quartz alkalic zone. So uh, if you have melting in the uh, orange zone here, that is the alkali calcic uh, source, and that would give you lead, zinc, and silver. Similarly, if, you, if the melting is occurring in this part of the slab, then you're gonna possibly have porphyry copper deposits in this yellow here. So the orogenies that have gone through Arizona since the last two billion years most of them have had a subducting zone that has become shallower with time. So as the zones of melting uh, get shallower, you have the types of ore deposits on top of each other. So uh, you may have, say, a quartz alkalic copper gold like Bisbee, and then later, it might be uh, the similar crust might be intruded by the alkali calcic or lead zinc silver things such as at Cortland. So eventually you get a very big complex mixture of ore deposit types. So Stan and I had great fun um, doing the detective work of figuring out these various um, uh, classes for the, all the different uh, or, uh, mineral systems. So another thing that we noted on the map was the oxidation state of the associated pluton. So for example, 
most of Arizona is this pink in the map. So and am the I. Pink I see here you. Here is uh, the oxidized oh. material. I, and the oxidized material. Well, I hope this is really helpful. It's really critical. Take notes has, and ask me questions afterward. This uh, crust would have influenced the material that came up through it. Most of the crust in Arizona is probably underlain by ruin granite, oracle granite, the 1.4 granites of the picarus orogeny, which have oxidized. Uh, we have figures. these figures. Yeah, so and we have to write they, all um, this data. And, they, and I am a director yeah. of the institute. Excuse me, can you uh, please mute yourself, John Mark? Sorry, Jan. Okay, I recognize your voice. So anyway, the oxidized crust has an influence on the fluids from the magma that is coming up. For example, if the oxidized crust is, ox if the crust is oxidized, then when the fluids come up, the gold in the fluids goes into the rock forming minerals. And the mineralizing fluids then are base metal rich, copper and, and uh, possibly lead zinc. So that is a refinement of the other classes, but it's important for mineral deposits because if you have this reduced crust, the blue, for example, here, then you are likely to have uh, more gold rich materials or even oil, for, for example, um, because in that case, the gold uh, does not, the, the base metals go into the rock forming minerals and the gold then goes out into the mineralizing solutions. So the oxidation state is another important um, feature. Now, when you're doing exploration, you can follow this decision tree. Again, the blues are the paraluminous and the warmer colors are the metaluminous. So you would do your uh, whole rock chemistry of the associated igneous rock. You would figure out the aluminum content and the alkalinity, which are on the maps. And you would follow down through this decision tree until you get to the um, part that is the fractional differentiation. And that is this diagram. And I don't expect you to see or recognize all these minerals, but the concept here is that you have a pluton that is fractionating. And as there is some kind of a release of structure uh, some kind of movement on a fault or something, then part of the material will solidify and emit or send out a mineralizing, a hydrothermal fluid. Then the part of the um, rock or the magma that is still liquid will um, move a little bit depending on where the fracks, uh, cracks are and you'll get another release of fluid. So this is what we call stage two, and it is related more to the iron rich part and the propolytic alteration. Then the stage three release is the part that is economic. In this case, this is a porphyry copper or metaluminous calcalcalic. You can have one of these differentiation diagrams for each one of the classes. But when you are in a, um, um, a series of um, fluid releases for the economic portion of the porphyry copper system, you want the stage three. That's where the, the, the chalcopyrite, the, the molybdenum and so on is. A later release would be, say, the breccia pipes, the, um, the, the um, molly quartz, quartz um, feldspar, and so on. So this is something that we put on the maps 
as stages only for the uh, porphyry copper systems. So on our maps, we designated that with numbers. So this, for example, is in Mojave County, um, the Wallapai district north of Kingman. And you see all these different districts that we subdivided it into. When you analyze it for the particular stage, we have stage three and four in this um, version here. So for example, the Ithaca Peak, uh, the place where the mineral park deposit is, that is a stage three. The stage fours are slightly later and more peripheral, and those have more either lead zinc or precious metals. So only for the porphyry coppers have we had this much detail. When we went through these districts, we um, found what we call a parade of orogenies. And each of the orogenies had a similar kind of um, sequence. So in the Precambrian, we had uh, orogenic belts or mountain building belts added to the craton, this, the core of the continent in a direction towards the southeast. So this map shows the southeasternmost edge, for example, of the Yavapai orogeny. So most of Arizona has a lot of Yavapai orogeny rocks, particularly in Yavapai County. Then the Picarus orogeny is the 1.4 granites and like the uh, Ruin granite and the Oracle granite, this is the southeasternmost edge, but there are plutons of Picarus orogeny all through all of the previous um, or orogenic belts. So most of Arizona's really deep crust is this Picarus orogeny, which is why so much of it is um, oxidized. When we looked through this parade of orogeny, we noticed that there were three phases to each orogeny. So the um, um, primary or the first one is the metaluminous, where you have a shallower uh, thing, uh, slab, and then paraluminous, which is the uh, flat subduction, and then the uh, when the crust is really high, then you have erosion and supergene alteration and rifting and uh, serpentine related uh, um, mud volcanoes. So here are the 14 or so orogenies, a few more if you add all these in the Paleozoic. Um, and you'll notice that this same sequence of the yellows and blues, yellows, oranges to blues, occurs in each one of these sequences. So you can get a different type of ore deposit in almost any one of these uh, sequences. So we're not gonna talk about all of them. You can uh, look at this on our website, the Magma Chem Research Institute website or on the AGS website and look at this in more detail. So one of the other things that became obvious was the intervals between the orogenies was when all the really pretty minerals uh, were uh, so obvious. And that was uh, during these reorganization events. So um, Stan now is gonna talk about the four, four out of the 10 different prospective um, places to look for ore deposits. So Troy, are you ready? We're ready. Okay, so I'm stopping my sharing and you're on. Okay, if everybody can mute their microphones, just one last reminder, Stan, the floor is yours. Okay, the floor is really two people right now. You notice that I like lizards, so my mascot, which is the doing the real thinking is sitting on the uh, 
modified dollhouse. And I am buried in all, this is typical work stuff here that involves all the various things we did to put together the um, mineral systems, which are quite different from the original map. And I might say that the one thing I think that was really important about the original map was that was the first time anybody had ever tried to draw a fence line around mineralization of a specific age and presume uh, magma associate and ultimately magma series metal type. So uh, in the case of the Arizona exploration potential that came out of this, we had four, four, well, ultimately 10, and there's probably more, but we're only going to talk about four of them. Uh, just a minute. I got a fast trigger over there. Uh, laramide uh, gold, and that's associated with the paraluminous calcic. These are typically sodium rich granites, really white granites, associated with flat subduction. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the Jurassic porphyries. And in a major new uh, cluster of these things that have shown up in western Arizona that were originally thought to be mid tertiary, but they're not. Talk more about that in terms of the dating information in a bit. And then we'll return to the old classic Precambrian volcanogene massive sulfide. There's still plenty of legs in those guys. And of course, our old favorite, the laramide, porphyry, copper, silver, molybdenum systems. And I might say that in the SCARN environments uh, for the Jurassic, we could almost add rhenium to that. That's, that's another thing that's going to emerge as a possible thing. You can put that in your airplanes. Back up. So we have a, um, a magma metal series, again, to reiterate, is an empirically based correlation of magma chemistry and metal associations linked in space and time. And that's a repeatable, specific, and again, source-based. That's what gives it its predictive power. Okay, next. Uh, the idea is to, from a, this is from a mineral collecting point of view. This is from an explorationist point of view. It would reduce exploration risk in a sequence regional to drill hole scale. That was sort of what that decision tree was telling you. And then when you get into a sequence, we typically find there's a geography to it that goes from mafic, mafic to intermediate to felsic with different fluid releases coming on along the way related to structure and depressurizations that tie into kinematic events going on as, on that structure. In this case, right slip, strike slip. And strike slip faulting is just really emerged in all of this. So that's the pluton vectoring. And then you can do element dispersion analysis to look at the zoning of the actual fluid systems that come off. Better get a good mapper on board to do kinematic structural analysis with detailed geologic mapping. I used to do that. And what we're really kind of doing here is regional tectonic and metallogenic analysis with that uh, mineral system map that we've been talking about. Next. So again, I want to emphasize the, this sort of restates things, uh, the low pressure structural sites. This is the uh, new Cornelia pit at Ajo, and we're bringing in a series from a diorite over here to the west through to a hornblende granite, biotite granite diorite. And then in the southeast part of the pit, we go into a biotite granite diorite, which is actually associated with a lot of copper mineralization that they never did finish mining. And that there's a lot, the vectoring says there's a lot of potential out under this sign. Okay. Again, just to emphasize, people have thought that this is where yeah. you're for porphyry coppers. Certainly. Okay, I'm watching, I'm watching a webinar. I can walk away from any time. Okay. But there's only uh, two, two epochs where you have what people would call real porphyries. One is in the early Jurassic, 
and we'll talk about that Western Arizona province in a minute. And the other one is in the Laramide, which is in the uh, basically the Lake Cretaceous Paleocene. And all the rest of these are something else. And yet a lot of people have looked at copper occurrences in these, tried to force them into one of these two guys without success. A lot of money's been spent errantly. Okay, next. So now we'll look at the paraluminous calcix. Now that's something that people looking for copper need to understand is that in Arizona, you'll get a little copper occurrences, but these are fundamentally gold. So copper stone is not a copper mine, it's a gold mine. And there are paraluminous granites there, despite what some people might want to say. And uh, we think it's going to be the same age as mesquite, which is well known for tuna as an old historical producer. But the really big one is this Herradura thing. There's probably there were north of 10 million ounces just in resource right now. Probably several million just came out of this pit, which is the first pit. And the first actual open pit was the mesquite mine down here. But we're sort of in a paraluminous gold belt here. And we've built tables and we have extensive spreadsheets on every polygon that's on the map, including these guys. Just some pretty minerals. Take a break. Look at uh, wolfenite. That, here, wolfenite's just not a collector mineral. It's a exploration guide at Herradura for gold. So whenever they see a little pocket of wolfenite in the Herradura open pit, they can expect they get excited because they can expect that they're going to be close to a pretty high grade gold occurrences in the pit. This gets back at the flat subduction and the idea that when you see a paraluminous granite that is telling you you had flat subduction. And not enough of that gets said around here. Everybody focuses on the plutons that lead to porphyries, but by far the most important things volume-wise in the laramide, for example, are these paraluminous granites. And they form the guts of the metamorphic core complexes. And when you see one, you can bet Dan 10 six packs that we've had flat subduction around here. And he won't take the bet. He knows what I'm talking about. Is that, in fact, looking at one at Vulture? Uh, Jurassic? Let's have a look. Okay, there's your familiar lavender pit. Now fading into history. But the new history in Western Ari uh, for Jurassic porphyries may be in Western Arizona at a place called Yuma King and several of these other ones that might be expandable. But I'm going to focus on Yuma King because I know that one pretty well. Uh, let's go to the next one. That's just some Bisbee stuff. And it's this cluster out here near Parker, Arizona. Oh, I'm going to. You know? And uh, in particular, we're going to look at uh, this one here uh, at Yuma King down at the su southern end of this thing. This is, this is quartz alkali. We're in the pink colors. And we know that we have a lot of petrochemistry at this one, Yuma King. Uh, there is an oxide uh, resource at uh, Yuma King, and you can see how the oxide things have been are replacing folded uh, stuff that's uh, been through the thrusting event. So these things are much older than any detachment event, but, but we have direct radiometrics, which we'll look at on this in a minute. Uh, there's a turquoise occurrence there, that uh, spiderweb turquoise, that potentially could get dug up. It's right in here. You could almost potentially put a small pit in here and possibly start digging turquoise. Next. Here's another bubble diagram, as I like to call them, which is a fractionation chart for quartz alkali. This is different, similar in style, but the, when you look in the gory details, you'll see different minerals in here appearing at different times in the hydrothermal fractionation sequence. And right now we're going to look at some stage four and three stuff. So here's uh, the stage three, and this is copper, gold, molybdenum, and we could add rhenium to it, which we do here. Uh, as per, this is an example, one of the higher grades where we had 1.86 weight percent copper, 
363 ppm molly, 370 ppm iridium. That's a big deal. 220 ppb gold. That's a good byproduct in, in 19 silver. Good byproducts. But there's a, a we got a lot of big rhenium numbers throughout the, up to a half a weight percent rhenium uh, in the SCARN environment, which I might say from talking to Rich Lavelle, that's same thing going on at Bingham, Utah. So this this is a Bingham, Utah analog. Here we are looking at folded calcopyrite magnetite SCARNs. And here's our stage four, glasgitic aplogranite, which intrudes biotite quartz monzonites. Uh, lots of moly in these core boxes. You can look at it easier, some nice assays. And we dated rhenium osmium, courtesy of Jonathan Boswell of Anglo-American. Uh, don't know if he's there now anymore, but uh, luckily we got enough. They uh, came and collected some of this, and we got 190.6 million year age on the, on the molybdenite, putting it in the Bisbee time epoch. And this has strong geologic analogy with those other things that we we're looking at. Next, which are these guys? So planet, mineral hill, Cienega, possibly Cabrala. All of these things potentially are expandable. I really like planet and mineral hill. Well, of course I like Yuma King. And by the way, get it back there. There is a goal play that I saw John Mark screwing up with our, our talk. Uh, and uh, that's right out in here. And that's for gold at about 160 million. And I don't know whether that's a Jurassic. It's possible it's associated with a paraluminous set of plutons, but I'm still trying to scratch my head on that. Next. Okay, so now we'll just go through the volcanogene guys real quick. Uh, this is our, our map of the Agua Fria belt, which has Jerome at the at one end, in, which is a big, massive sulfine. 30, 26, 30 million tons. And a similar one that's growing at K. They're adding more drill holes to it as we speak. I heard that it might be north of 6 million tons, and it's probably expandable. I don't know, maybe up to 10 million, but it's it's something that is a historical thing that Exxon expanded into several million tons, and it's continuously being expanded. Talk to Dan Lax a little bit more about that. Up here in uh, Yavapai, or uh, Mojave County, we have the Antler Mine, which is actively being explored, and I think they're adding tons there. And I think the Pinafore has some holes in some good copper zinc ore, and that's expandable, and that's kind of an, an extension of the old Dick Massive Sulfide Belt south of Baghdad. Just a little bit more, just showing where K is and just giving you a sense of the texture of these maps that we've put together. For example, there's some Laramide overprint in the Ticonderoga plutons. So there's all kinds of different ages. This is a classic example of how you've had all kinds of different things mixing around that is a f product of all of these, this parade of orogenies and parade of overprints. And you can sort them out using the magma metal series approach. And here, of course, is the classic at Jerome. No more needs to be said there. Next. Just giving you a little idea how these form. This is fractionation from a rhyolitic magma source. Probably had black smokers, but not submarine black smokers, arc black smokers. This happens to be a modern seafloor black smoker from 21 degrees north, I think. Next. Now we'll take a look at our porphyries. And these are porphyry copper plays brown fields. That's why the brown circles. Uh, these are also re include recent discoveries. So it's kind of a semantical switch up as to how you want to play this game. But of course, the most recent one is the resolution. And I think there's good p play north of uh, the currently known resolution under Oak Flat. It goes right up to it. And it's going to keep going. That's going to be a good brownfields play, possibly deep resolution. Cholito southeast, if you're down near uh, Hayden. Christmas west underneath the uh, 
um, the old classical uh, Martin formation replacement ore bodies in the O'Carroll bed. This this is a diabase play, and they need to drill that hole. I keep bugging them to do that. They haven't done it yet. And these other ones we'll worry about later. And we'll take a look at the Greenfields play here real quick at Troy Ranch. Uh, we're, we, I think we're out of sequence here. Keep going. Oh, yeah, okay. So these are stage fours. These are the veins. This is a magma vein, uh, mine. Uh, I saw Scott Vansky. It's funny because, uh, you know, I, I've been convincing on it. Everybody's been convincing on it. And they all know, yeah, yeah, there's got to be some big thing out to the east. Well, I, I got there my own way. This is a stage four vein. And in terms of looking at how its metal zoning went, it said there's got to be something out to the east and possibly to the south, and you got to go get it. And, of course, eventually they did. Scott Mansky was part of the discovery team. Okay, so here's the uh, – God, you just love to have that clicker. It's got control over me. Uh, so uh, this is a good example of – magma of liquid liquid fractionation that's what happens in these things is you get a because these are really hydrous magmas you get a density driven fractionation so the, the high density stuff fractionates and it creates its own magma bubbles which you can see have frozen against a lighter matrix here so the lighter matrix which is lower density it moves on and the darker stuff which is in this case the this sort of hornblende biotite granite diorite stays behind. And the white stuff moves on, and then this, this stuff will release this event, which is the stage three. So, but this then is a different kind of fractionation. So, but, but if we look at this, we see how we have the dark crystals and the lighter crystals, especially on this one, this ocular guy. And that's crystal liquid fractionation as opposed to liquid liquid fractionation that we were looking at. And then these other types are high. Once you get the hydrothermal release, that's hydrothermal fractionation. Anyway, so we're going to take a look at a couple of these applied to the Troy Ranch guy. And the ones you most want to pay attention to are these orange guys. That's our stage threes. We got a lot of it right here and it goes underneath cover to the north. And we have a beautiful diabase target here that has, hasn't been drilled yet. So that's something to think about. And then it forks off in two other directions. There could be diabase targets out here, but on a volume basis, I like this one. And I also like it because of the structural setting up here associated with the ray shear zone. Lots of places of depressurization along that thing. Okay, looking at the uh, biotite hornblende granite diorite, that's our 2.75. There's actually a lot of more pulsing, so there's more phases in this. Pluton's quite complex. And then the biotite granite diorite stage three, that's the guy especially you want to track. And you'll find your good copper mineralization associated with that. Uh, next, this gives you an idea of that. This is a... Uh, K feldspar vein associated with a little bit of calcopyrite quartz, uh, be your so called D veins. And you can see it's cutting a stage three biotite granite diorite, which in turn cuts a biotite hornblende granite diorite, fairly mafic, which has propylitic alteration that, and pyrite veinlets that are cut by this guy. So the main best takeaway here is that this is not all about one pluton source and one fluid release that does a classical Lowell Gilbert light bulb one shot uh, zoning system. These are a sequence of plutons, each with its own fluid release event. And that's, that's what I think new explorationists need to take into account. And I think if they start thinking along that line, that's going to improve their exploration success. Next. So in summary, we have reorganization events between mountain building episodes that allow oxidation of sulfides 
into collectible and very economic calcite blankets, for example, mineral uh, accumulations. Uh, Arizona needs to take, geology needs to really look at the influence of flat subduction. It's underrated. Uh, and how that we've built our crust from the bottom, not just by accretion events, but why that's been caused by flat slabs just slapping up and accreting to the base of the evolving Proterozoic crust. And then flat subduction is the melting one that happens. You melt that crust and you make paraluminous granites. And that's uh, something that current tectonics has not taken into account. Super systems are important because they're, they're essentially a large batholith area that's fractionating smaller uh, repetitions of itself into the upper crust, and so you create several clusters of mineral systems like that one we saw in western Arizona, the Jurassic guy. Again, don't get too... Uh, because we've had these so many of these different events, they're an opportunity not just for copper, but I, I would, st again, stress gold, but if you if you know zinc's not that bad lately and silver's not that bad, you want to maximize the opportunities for that. You want to be looking in the alkali calcics, and you don't want to be looking so much in the calcal calyx. Don't chase. Uh, that just restates what I just said, and uh, and again, flipping that little coin a little bit. Alkali calcic mineral systems are sucker plays for copper and or gold, unless you want that zinc silver. And with that, we wrap it up. We've done four. We plan a webinar where we're going to talk about the other ones and expand and talk about the whole thing over a two-hour short course, which we'll be announcing through our website um, for in the near future. And now we can take questions. Yes. We'd love.